Um, okay, so so in terms of the name, I mean, um, I was when when I was born, um, my mom is from KZN, my dad is from Pumalanga, my mom um, is from Newcastle, and my dad in, in KZN, and my dad is from Carolina here in Pumalanga. So when a eh, so when I was born um, in KZN, my parents at the time were not married, and my dad gave me the name Nuziswe. But it is, it is, um, it's not a common name to give to a child in KZN. It is a common enough name, but not, there aren't many Nuzis with. Um, so my mother's side of the family rejected the name and said, what kind of a name is that? Nuzis means um, loosely what? She who belongs to the nations. Mm -hmm. um, and my mother's side of the family, so they rejected it. Her older sisters said no, and they gave me a name to Duzile which is a very, very common name. It's a beautiful name, but it's a name that um, comes from one of my mother's oldest sister's friend. So, so they named it after, after her, Duduzile. And when, so I became Duduzile. Um, so when I started school, as it was in those days, you had to have a Christian name. So my uncle named me Cynthia, so I became Tutuzile Cynthia. But my dad had always referred to me as Nozizwe. In fact, my family, um, I've always been Nozizwe, even though those two names are not in my ID. Um, so yeah, so when my dad passed on in 2010, I just went back to my, to my name um, as a way of um, remembering and honoring him. So that's the, the three names. When I published Cynthia, it, it already published, and when I published um, Happiness is a Four Letter Word, it was published under Cynthia, but now I'm bringing Nozis. So eventually it will just be Nozis way. Um, but I'll write a story about my names, because I also, uh, people just have a tendency to, to give me nicknames. I'm Nozi, I'm Zizwe, I'm DJ, I'm CJ. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's just like, yeah, I'm one of those people that people just um, nickname. Okay. Interesting. Well, as I said, my English name is Masha. I, when I asked my mom about it, she said she was... Masha really, Tena. No, no, <laughs> not, not Masha Tena. My mom was reading one of those Daniel Steele novels, so oh, she got the name from, from that. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, I must acknowledge that you're also an award-winning author, not just any writer. Thank and you. And then that your first book was published in 2010, yes. Happiness is a Four-Letter mm. Word, mm. which was full of love and crazy stuff by those four ladies yeah. and you came back with a bang a big bang i must say the Thank blue you. book is doing wonders uh, when i read it i think i bought it in may mm. and it was a saturday my mom was home and she took the book and read it and read it knowing very well that no one touches my books before i read them okay. but i let her then like she was concentrating and she started paging through page one two three said, mm. I relate because mm. my aunt had cancer and we we're not told until think after the treatment. Mm. No one told us about mm. it. So we related so much mm. in the story. Mm. So I just want to find out the ones with purpose. Who are the ones with purpose? The one dying or us being left behind? Oh, okay. <laughs> so the, 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 the title, The Ones with Purpose, comes from um, a section in the book so the pastor, when the pastor comes to do the, the after Figili passes on and the pastor comes to, um, as opposed to uh, pass his condolences to the family, he, cause he's coming from another bereavement. He's coming, to, coming from another bereavement. So he comes to this family and it's a bereavement of a young person as well. So he comes and he says, you know, afterwards that... Um, the, young, the, young, the ones with purpose are dying, who's going to be there to bury us? So that's where the title of the book comes from. But um, I, I, obviously I don't believe that the ones with purpose are dying. I don't believe that us, the living <laughs> who are here, have absolutely no purpose in this life. It's just, it, it comes from, from, from his saying. And sometimes I suppose you do feel that, right? Especially when you lose a loved one or a very crit an important person and you're just like, yeah. Uh, who's going to be left, you know, like all the, the ones that shouldn't be here are still mm. here. <laughs> <laughs> but I also... <laughs> <laughs> you can't interrupt, it's Bobo <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a chance. I just wanted to say, I feel um, in this family, Figile was the one with purpose. Mm. If I can just read uh, these two lines, which says, um, 
Figila got a road deal out of life. Sometimes I wish I had my brother's attitude. I'll be far in life. Mbuso chose himself. I th the reason I'm saying Figile was the one with purpose, because she was the one taking care of the family. She got married like mm -hmm. while she was still young, so mm -hmm. that she can take care of the family because the mother got drunk and all. Mm -hmm. And I also want to find out why did you decide? Because in most cases, it's the fathers. Mm. who go out and drink when, when there's trouble at home. But mm. in this case, in this scenario, you mm. decided to make the mother who's supposed to be strong for the family. Yeah. And you decided to make her a drunkard. Yeah, I think it's also just looking, it's, it's a different narrative. It's, it's you know, we, we write things that, the, we write different things, you know, you write different scenarios, like what if, what if it's, 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 it's Baba who passes on and then mom cannot cope. Mm -hmm. Um, because also as women, I think our mothers carry so much. Our mothers are su just supposed to be these strong people who get, you know, get collect themselves and, and can move on. But it's not necessarily so. And in this case, this one, for example, does not, after that trauma, is not able to, you know, to carry on. You know, she tries for a little bit because after um, the funeral, she gets up and she goes and she tries to work. She tries to go back to normal, whatever that normal might look like, but, um, and then she collapses. Mm -hmm. um, but, but also, I, I do also have a personal experience with a family member who went through the same trauma and she just never recovered. And, and unfortunately for her, she, she passed on never having had a second, a proper second chance mm -hmm. in life, um, which is why I guess for me, bringing, making sure that Ma, you know, um, um, overcomes um, her, 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 her issues and her situation was, was also important. But yeah, um, there are a lot of women who suffer from, um, from depression, from, um, from grief, because if you look at it, Ma never had time to grieve. You know, she never really had time to mourn her husband. As soon as that happened, she was just then expected, you know, the children had to go to school. Somebody had to, um, to go outside and work. And she just, she just did that until her mind, her body couldn't anymore. So, yeah, I, I, I think for me it was important to look at um, women and the, some of the things that you would not normally. And we all, <laughs> that's the funny thing is we all know that ma from that street or two streets away or from that section, mm -hmm. yes. we all have that ma in our lives, but nobody talks about them as to why they ended up like that and, 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 and how, did, you know, how could they get out of that situation. Okay. Um, talking about uh, this illness, cancer, you'd expect more, most writers to write about HIV because we think HIV is killing like yeah. everyone like in yeah. a very high speed. But we forget about cancer. So how did you come about choosing um, to write about cancer? Yeah. I actually was going to write about HIV initially. Um, when I was conceptualizing the book, so those many, many years ago, like 2011, I think that's when I started thinking about this book. Um, and it, I was going to write about HIV and AIDS because I think for me it felt like it was still taking so many lives and it kind of the, the talk about it was, was dying down. It wasn't at the height where everything was HIV. I wanted to bring it. But then, you know, as you talk and then you realize that no, but there's another killer you know, and, 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 and we haven't written it. At least I had not read I had not read a story um in, in, in a in a in a fiction way and particularly set in a black community that, 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 that talks about cancer and the ravages and really what it does to, 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 to a family. So I use that opportunity then to um, bring this um, this disease into into the fore. It's a very selfish book, I must say, um, in a sense that I, I, I tried, I've used it to try and educate, which is completely different to how I wrote Happiness. Happiness was just, you know, the story as it happened. But this one, I, I was really intentional about the research. I was really intentional about making sure that the facts, everything that I was writing, uh, was actually very factual. And in some, some areas, I was, 
I was almost prompting my reader to go and do something, like in the case where you have, you know, they're talking about figurally touching a breast and mm. checking herself. Like I was hoping that, um, you know, when you read it, you'll actually that night, you'll go to the <laughs> bathroom and actually and check, check your it. check your breast. Mm. Yeah, so it just, it, this, this book allowed me to, you know, to, 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 to pass on that, that message as well. Okay. And there's a passage in the book where you wrote about when the doctor called um, Anele and told her that Figile hasn't got much time to leave. They should take her home. Mm. Um, I've experienced that this year in May. Our nanny who has been with us for 24 years, she started getting sick in January. Then around April, the hospital called me said, no, you should uh, take her home. Yeah. And I said, no, I can't. <laughs> like, I can't take her. It's better what are you going to do with her? <laughs> yes, it's home. better she yeah. just dies here in hospital. Yeah. So yeah. I just want to know, is it easier for family members to deal um, with death when the person dies at home or in the hospital? Because like, I was a bit confused. Yeah. And in the book, I come across the same thing. Is it what is happening to... Yeah, yeah. Uh, the sick people. To the sick people, mm. yeah. I think it does get to, um, to a point, especially with cancer, um, if it's a terminal illness like that, um, either people go home or they get sent to hospice. So you can choose. Um, and, 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 and for them, it was, you know, it, it, had, to be, it had to be home. And Anele tried to do that. Anele tried yeah. to say, no, um, what are we going to do? And, but she couldn't sleep. <laughs> You know, I guess for uh, because she, you know, she. It's like when she, for me, it was the point where she reconciles um, for the last time. I guess that no, this mm -hmm. this person is going, and she she wakes up the following morning. She goes in and fetches her from the hospital. Yeah. So I think um, yeah, w with 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 terminal illness, that tends to be the hospital does tell you um, that you know you either have to take. You have two choices, and 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 home, and and she, the nurse does say that you know at home you die, it's like you die a dignified death. Mm -hmm. You know you've got your family around you. Yeah, it it it. I haven't experienced it, um, but um, yeah, I don't know how I would deal <laughs> with it if I were to, you know, to be the so, one who had to care of um, a terminally ill person. And another interesting uh, fact that touched me in the story, when Figila started to get sick, and then there's mom turning to the church. Do we forget about church when everything is going well in our lives? And when we have problems, then that's when we turn um, to the pastors and mm. the women in church mm. for assistance. But remember, Ma was not well up to a point where I think when um, C's were um when they when Cizwe came because out of when Cizwe came Cizwe came before Figila got sick um so when Cizwe became a part of their lives Ma mm. started to heal I think for her it was kind of re coming closing that chapter with losing Mbuso mm. well not losing in a sense that he passes on but just like Mbuso and having this new son like seeing Cizwe as her son and she, she slowly starts to come out of her slump. And with that getting better, and then now with the news, you know, figure that happening, um, I think for me, she felt confident enough to go, to go back to the church. Because mm -hmm. she had been, uh, she, 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 she hadn't allowed herself to be part of the community, if you think about it. She'd been mm -hmm. shunned off by the community. And um, for her, the first place where she felt she could, she could return was 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 the church and Figila did help with that as well because she was also very much part of a um, a church goer. She was like part of the church community, but yeah, the the the. <laughs> 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 okay, just to get like everyone in the story, can we read like the okay. page forty one that Anela was not alone like in this journey. Okay. She had to rely on her family, the aunt, and everyone else. Okay, okay. Um, okay, so we re you start. Sh sh okay, should I start from. Okay, I, I'm going to start from the top. Okay, okay. That's fine. So the ca figurless cancer had spread to the lymph nodes and it appeared aggressive, attacking and mutating and destroying everything along its path. The breast and affected nodes would have to go. 
And then there will be chemo and radiation therapy and five years of hormone treatment to reduce the chances of the cancer returning. Dr. Seme said, the wet mastectomy danced in front of my eyes. Figula didn't bat an eyelid which was just as well because my downpour in Dr. Seme's office was enough for both of us. Instead, she sat up straight, looked at the doctor and said in the most serious tone, when can we do the surgery? The doctor smiled. Well, breast cancer is a war. You are already on your way to winning the battle with your positive spirit. She scheduled the surgery to take place in two weeks. I called a meeting of close family members to break the news about Figula's cancer. Ma wept and asked God why he had not given, him, given, given her the cancer and pleaded with him to spare Figula's life to raise her children. Auntie Betty scolded Ma, said she was being dramatic and childish. Ma told Auntie Betty that she wouldn't understand that only, she wouldn't understand that only women who had given birth will comprehend her anguish. Auntie Betty rolled her eyes, took her tub of snuff and went outside. We heard a sneeze several times. Aunt Ndombi, the youngest of the three sisters, quoted impressive survival statistics. She mentioned friends of friends who walked around with breast and we just we walked around without breast and were just as alive as women with both breasts. Teaser sat quietly throughout and later got smashed. Suiza had to pick him up from the local tavern and drive him home. Figuele took a pair of pantyhose and molded it into a tight bolt and lifting it up said laughing i've always wanted to have pecky boobs no one laughed with her oh come on people live through cancer right it's not a death sentence i'll beat it figure protested i will and after mine my aunts had prayed for figure long prayers i didn't know they were capable of spewing from their mouths and everyone had gone i called them buso I had not spoken to my brother in months and not even seen him since the incident at his wedding earlier in the year, which had left a spectacular awkwardness between him and Figile. Mbuso said he will come on the day of the operation. He asked me to keep his visit between us. He said he was not ready to face the rest of the family. All through this, Figile hadn't cried. Um, when an illness like struck one family members, do we ever have time to sit down and talk about it and who'll take care of the person that's sick or mm -hmm. everyone just goes to a little corner and yeah i i we we all i think we all we all think they're gonna we don't we don't understand the extent of the graveness of the illness until it's late i always believe we always think that it's going to a person is always going to survive you know whenever someone is ill you always think the, you know, like you never think of the worst. Mm. You always think like they're going to pull through. And you don't, uh, unless that, that situation is, is facing you and you just don't have a way out, I think the rest of the family, we call, we check in, we forget, we move on with our lives, and then weeks later you remember, oh, sorry, and so it's not well, let me call, let me go mm. see them. But we never treat it with that agency. Um, and, and so it never really... We never really talk about it in, in that sense because in our minds, we are humans. We always, we, we always hope for the best. And, 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 and also in this case, I mean, I've also personally, we've had um, you know, illnesses in the family and then someone passes on, but you just never think it's gonna happen. But and did you ever discuss um, about the illness? Yeah. Because with me, with my aunt, they never told us anything until it was very late. Oh no, the, the C word is not mentioned. The cancer is never mentioned in families until it's too late. I, I don't know why. We don't, we, you know, you, you, even people who know um, that somebody has been diagnosed, they rarely ever come out and say this is what it is. Uh, my, mom's, uh, uh, my mom is a nurse. She would just say, gooby. It's, it's <laughs> you know, it's, it's, um, it's, 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 it's not looking good, you know, the, mm. usually she will say it. Um, and then, but there will come a time because, you know, you also ask um, after a while, like, okay, this is not getting better. And then you kind of have to force it for people to tell you what, what it is. And I don't know whether it's to protect, it's to protect everyone from, you know, feeling that, mm. I, 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 I really don't know, oh, again, it's that thing that, you know, we will deal with it and it's, 
it's always the elderly who knows and then us the, the, the kids are left you wondering. know you left wondering what it is so i i do appreciate it now um i i do see especially with my family now we we do talk about we do talk about these things but we also ask as, as kids like okay what is it like tell us what what is going on mm. Mm. and then now figure dies and then it's the time for the funerals and in the black society funerals are a huge <laughs> thing just like a wedding yes, um, yes why does it have to be that way like, i don't know and i don't like it <laughs> <laughs> i've said this a number of times um yeah i i actually I, I actually do not understand it there is a section in here where it's actually a conversation between me and my mother where i said to her when i die i want to be cremated and 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 like literally she made me take it back <laughs> like she said, take it back, and I had to say, okay, I'm kidding, don't do it. Um, but but I don't know, and it causes so much. The family does not have time to grieve, right? Because you're busy baking scones. Because <laughs> now you're gonna have the influx of people. You're thinking, and you never really have time to grieve. And 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 that's why you know, like Ma collapses at the end. You mm. know, when everything is done, because. Only now the grief, the heaviness of it hits her. But um, I don't know why we do it, and I don't know how to change it. Uh, but I think we need to. I think we need to change it, um, and 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 just allow, you know, allow the family to go through those emotions without. Mm. Yes, come and support them, but don't don't take over. You know, like it becomes about. <laughs> Yes, it becomes that whole week. And, and, and sometimes, you know, if it happens on a Monday or a Tuesday, no, you can't bury until that weekend. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And it's like, why? You just cannot. We don't do that. So it puts it put so much pressure on this family because now you have to, everyone that comes is expecting to be fed and, and accommodated. And, and, and it just puts so much pressure in the family. And you forget that there is death in the family until mm. a Friday before the funeral, yes. right? When the coffin comes and it's like, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> this is not a wedding situation. Mm. Yeah, but I, I, I really do wish we could change it. I, but I do see in some families now, like they bury during the week. Yes. Which, which for me, I think it makes sense. You cut so many costs. And you as a family just have enough time to do what you need to deal with. But yeah, I really question I really question the way we do things. Like in Pumalanga you bury <laughs> you bury yeah, at seven or eight in the morning. But after that there is pop, there is rice, there is at nine in the morning people are queuing for that. Every, Why? It's everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's, everywhere. Why? It, it's happening everywhere. No, I get it when the funeral happens later in the day. But it's breakfast. Give them scones and juice and tea and let everyone go home. I don't, uh, in, Swaziland, in Swaziland, they bury around 5, 6 in the morning. In the morning. Then at 7, you're having like a full Mean. 7 colors. Yes. Meal. Why? So Why? <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah so no, I, 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 I think have so just many to questions. get the feel in the funeral in this book, uh, can we go to page 225? Okay. And okay, so page 225. Yeah. yeah, so this is now when you, you all remember that, okay, you're here mm. for the funeral. Um, so Figula's body arrives in a white funeral car with white flags flanking its side. Mbuso and Antintombi's cars follow slowly behind, hazards flashing. A small group of family and friends and strangers have gathered near the gate, singing church hymns in controlled, somber voices. They erupt into fits of hysteria when the procession passes through. Fresh grief fills the air as if Figile has just died. From Lesitla's bedroom, I watch the driver of the house and his assistant jump out of the car and place Figile's coffin on the stretcher and with Auntie Tombi's instructions, will her inside the house. Tisa's mother and Auntie Betty emerge from the house, followed by Ma, whose limp body threatens to tumble under the pressure of heartache. Auntie Betty links her arm and under, under her sister's shoulder and with the help of Uncle Majaha, pushes her forward to the house. It is a scene I witnessed at my father's funeral. I had watched my mother's legs cave in and her body collapse on the ground when they brought his body home. 
when she came to, after Auntie Betty dabbed a, a damp cloth on her forehead and made her drink sugar water, she got to her feet, went straight to the closed coffin. The undertakers had recommended the family not view the body due to the severity of the, inju of the injuries. She burst and screamed at the wood as though her dead husband would suddenly wake up and apologize for the confusion. It took three grown men to subdue Ma and moved her away from the, cotton, from the coffin. Someone gave her pills that made her sleep throughout the wake and the night. When she woke up the following morning, she washed and dressed and moved around like her husband had not died. Mother buried our father without shedding a tear. When the funeral was over, the last of the pots cleaned and relatives gone, leaving the silence. She went to sleep and never really woke up. Now Mbuso does not leave his car. He sits, his head hunched over the steering wheel. At our father's funeral, Mbuso was restless, screaming from Ma. He was five. He had cried, gnawed at my thighs until Ma saw him and motioned that I bring him to her. I now watch the procession as if the coffin is carrying someone I vaguely know. A neighbor from three streets away, a distant grandmother I last saw when I was 12, someone I only knew by name, and not my sister, Figile. Soon I will join the morning. Strangers will reach my, will search my face and try to make eye contact to assure me that I'm not alone. No one is ever alone in this. Friends and family would cling on to me, weeping into my neck, screaming Figile's name, their warm tears soaking my dress until I too burst out. Figila would have hated everything about this moment. So will you say funerals are a meeting place now. You see this family is coming together yes. because of Figila's funeral. Yes, yes. And yeah. they only came once when she was sick and there was that family meeting. Yes, yes. So yeah, for, 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 for most members, except for those, obviously for those who are very close and are always in touch with the, with, 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 with the, with the one who is sick, those are the ones who will constantly be there. But the, the extended family, um, you, you, you don't see them. But again, again, it comes back to, I don't think it's because out of being spiteful. I think it's just thinking, no, somebody's going to be fine. They're going to be fine. And sometimes even the family, we don't say how the situation is you always say oh today he's not feeling better but tomorrow let's hope and then we live with that hope until then it's it's it's, it's too late and then yes then the, the the big meetings and everybody comes because everybody supports a funeral everybody <laughs> the yeah. auntie from the eastern cape will take the train all night all day to get to the funeral yeah and where is figula's husband in all of this Teaser, he's being a trash. <laughs> <laughs> so is that what men do when the wife gets sick and the wife goes back home? The men just do crazy things, we all know Why that. do you do that, men? <laughs> why? Yes, why? Why? Yes, yes. <laughs> why do you do that? <laughs> mm -hmm. Pile, Pile has nothing to say about this. Because <laughs> he knows, he knows they're trash. <laughs> Guys, I think I'll open up for questions. If you've got anything to say. Yes. No, 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 no. Pile, wait. My sister, is it normal for a woman to cheat when she's in very poor teacher? In this book, this woman was married to a teacher who retired from work and then you are seen with some big e guy and they have a child together. Mm -hmm. And that's happened on her area or whatever. Okay, mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it normal? What is normal? No, I'm saying <laughs> Are you women saying to us that we have a, a husband who is poor, <laughs> like Nick, and they will see and they will wait on the side with a big e. Okay, time up. Then you put Fred, who has a tender from government. Then you put him in my business. Yeah, let me speak. Let me speak. This woman. 
Okay, we've got the question. It's a restaurant. Okay. Okay. And then, and then they try to get with that man. And then the last man, poor lady, in the money. Okay. Okay. And when they died, no, no, when the wife died, and, and they said, I knew about it. I was with you, I was with you, with this, with Fred, in this place, and it's a best fish. No, let's give somewhere in my area now. You see? Okay, give Cynthia a chance to answer. If you give me an answer, tell us now. Yeah. Wow. wow. You, see, you see why we say men are trash? Yes. Okay, let's move along. Okay, next question. <laughs> there was a hand. No, no, wait. Let's no, give. No, I'm not going to answer that. Is it normal? Is it it's normal? not normal. What is normal? This is what I'm asking. Why? Can you give someone a chance to, to ask no. a question? My question is about um, the writing process. This yes. sounds like a very heavy story. It's yes. very emotional. How was the writing process for you? Did it yeah. take you under or was it just work that you do? Yeah. Uh, some some part of the books were quite um, difficult. The researching the cancer um, was particularly hard because I I was reading a lot of books um, by cancer survivors, and I was reading a lot of YouTube videos uh, where cancer survivors were talking about their processes and um, what they'd gone through, the the the, um, the treatment itself, and how it left them feeling. Um, but I think the most difficult for me was reading blogs because somebody is some, somewhere blogging about it and then you'll be reading a blog, you'll be following a blog and then there'll be just like one day you wake up, you read your blog and there's a paragraph that says unfortunately so and so can no longer contribute, they, she, she passed on and, and, and so those were difficult um, and because and, and it just made you realize that you know these are real people, real people behind the videos, real people behind these stories um, and yeah so writing about, writing about death itself was, 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 was you know it was death but the, the cancer that research was, was the most difficult for me yeah but the it, 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 it's a it's a it's a lovely family. They are flawed, mm. but you know they, they they are there for each other. So some characters were quite fun to write, mm. quite interesting to write. Auntie Betty was just that you know that matriarchy, that woman that you just when 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 certain scenes were difficult, I would I would want to find Auntie Betty to just kind of come in and subdue. Um, certain scenes, yeah, but but it's like it's family, yeah, it's it's family, and once you once you have put yourself into a family, I think it's just and and you've created this family, it's e it it it's easier then to start developing the different the different the different characters and just seeing how they each merge and, 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 and come together. I don't, I always say, um, it is a heavy book, the themes are heavy, but I, mm. I, I, I don't think it's sad as such. I always say that I don't know how to write sad. Like, mm. I, I don't, it's not hauntingly like you, you, you it, it, it's that, you know, it, it brings that kind of heaviness and sadness. Mm. No, but <laughs> I couldn't read any other book for a month. I couldn't read any other book for a month after reading your book. Like it was too heavy for me. Okay. okay. Yes. I, I, I wanted to ask how the novels which you have written have reflected the growth experiences in your own life and what you are looking to what you can write next. Oh, okay. Um, what am I planning to write next? What was the first question? So, how the themes that you tackled in your books have affected your own personal life or yeah. your experience yeah. and growth? Yeah. And yeah. Okay. So, so, so this one, it's um, because I'm, I'm over forty now, and <laughs> really, what I've written. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm old. So what I've written is is is, is really my observations. It, it's what it's what we go through at mm -hmm. this age. We bury, you know. We what are you what are you doing on Saturday? Oh, I'm going to a funeral. It's like becoming our things, you know. Like, hmm? 
<laughs> when we are not here, we are at funerals, right? Stop. So that, that, that's basically what we do. But it also, um, for me, what was personal about this book was just the, this under, I don't know what, what's happening with, with, with young people. I feel like young people or people my age um, to, to, for that, um, we're losing our lives. We're dying, mm. you know, so, and we're dying, we're dying young. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and that, that, that is, has been one of the things that I wanted to, to reflect in this book. Um, I always write about my observations at any particular point in time. Oh, at least the, the, the two novels that I've written have been about that. Um, when I wrote Happiness, I was um, a bit younger and um, I, was I, was, I was looking for things. I was looking mm -hmm. for comfort. I was looking for a nice townhouse in Centen. I was looking, looking, looking. I wanted, wanted, wanted. Uh, but this is now kind of like, you know, 10 years later, and, uh, eight, 10 years later, um, it's like, okay, what, what am I seeing? What am I observing? Um, yeah. In terms of what could be next, um, sure, I have so many ideas. I don't have anything concrete at the, at the moment. I, I do want to write a collection of um, short stories, um, actually two collections of short stories, one which I'm hoping to use as a fundraising initiative um, and the other which would just be my, my collection. And, and I've, co I've come up with the title at the moment, which is a working title called Jobek is full of lonely people. Next question. Um, Hi. Hi. I wanted to ask, what conversations do you think um, black people need to have? Because you were talking about how we, we tend to shy away from things such as cancer. And I'm sure cats are not the only um, thing that, that goes around. But I, from my experience, my short experience, I've seen that a lot of um, conversations aren't happening in a lot of um, black households. And I want to, wanted to know, since you've written the book, you've done the research and everything, what conversations do you think need to happen more in, in, in black households, black cultures, black communities? Yeah. Uh I, I, I think writing books like this for, for starters help. Uh, my mother is reading this right mm. now. And every now and then she calls and she say, how uba fun? Can taxi in You know? And, um, and, and she'll quote things here and then, and, 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 and then we'll talk about it. Um, but but uh, we, we I think sometimes it's us who are who know now because we we are the knowing generation. I would like to feel to think that we there's so much um, there's so much that is available for us. There's so much there's so many outlets of information and 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 we carry that knowledge and and we 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 should be the generation that ask because um, our parents don't know how to tell. You know, they, they won't necessarily, parents don't, won't necessarily volunteer information unless you've asked for it. So I, I, I think if we can start not fearing, um, fearing them, but starting to open conversation, because sometimes I honestly think they don't know how. They were not raised like that. They were not raised to be open. They can't even talk to, to you about mm. sex education. They, 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 they're not open up like that. But if you were to find ways, because we are bec we beca becoming more exposed to information, we're becoming more exposed to ways of communicating and communicating upwards. So I think we, 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 have, we, we, we can use that to, to kind of reach out to, um, to, 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 to our parents, to our grandparents. Um, I do, definitely, I, 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 I'm one of those people who, who can have con conversation. And I think everything is, shouldn't be off limit, you know. We, we should be able to talk about everything, from cancer, from death, from, mm, yeah. um, sometimes you say it in a joke, you know. Um, you, you, you know how your families are. So, some, sometimes you say something in a joke and they will be shocked and then, but, <laughs> but then you will be like, yeah, you know, then you'll start engaging, um, engaging them. We, the, the generation before us, um, I think, has very difficulty in, in communicating. Um, yeah, but, but I think we, 
we, we stand a better. Like children now, a 10 year old, 8 year old, they ask about everything. No subject is off limit. Mm. And I wish, you know, I like that. I enjoy that. I, I, I envy that about them. So they grow with knowledge. They grow knowing how to be open. They, 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 they express themselves. You know, they tell you 10 times how much they love you. You know, we, 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 because that's what they see. That's what they experience. That, that's what they're learning. And, and I think if we, if we can just cultivate that and then from us do the same and then kind of work upwards um, around that, I think. Uh, I, I think, yeah, a, a four-year-old will tell you where to get off. They will, tell, they will <laughs> just, you know, like they, they, will just, they will just communicate. But I feel it's our parents who don't want to talk. Like of late, I've been asking my mom, mom, what do you want to be buried with when you die? And she'd be like, no, we'll talk some other time. So yeah. no, I want to know now. Do you want me to take you back <laughs> but to Swaziland? But you also can't say Do you like want that. me to, <laughs> to bury yes, you like yes, at your yes, in-laws? Or yes. Then she said, no, wherever you'll be, then yes, bury me there. Then and I said, OK, there. fine. That's what yeah. I want. Yes. Because I don't want to struggle when you're gone. Yes. And I'm even scared to bury you somewhere. Maybe you don't even want to be buried yes. there. So yes. I think it's up to us to open up and Those talk conversations. about these things. Yes. 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 Um, it's almost time up. Any more questions? When uh, you are done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You've got a question. I think Pile, there's one question. No, it's just to appreciate that uh, the book uh, is really eye opening. Yeah, there's quite a few parts of it. I really liked it. But uh, most people who are Teens are open up to the system to say, you know, why is it going on in his mind? Actually, I thought about it because most men, they do things. So he was also, uh, you know, traumatized and he was dealing with it in a different way because yeah. the sister was shutting him away and he couldn't open up and say, you know what, this is what is happening. So I was kind of relieved that he did say, what was his problem? Though he doesn't make him you know, the better person, yeah. but I really like that. So, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 you get different emotions. Okay, yeah, cause people are multidimensional, like, people have there's so much to a person. He may not be a likable character, but there's mm -hmm. just that one part where you just feel him and you understand him and you, you get where he's coming from. And Anneli, it was important for Anneli also to to get that with him because she also was part of the, the I mean, Tisa doesn't make it easy for you to like him. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 but, but yeah, that, that was important because then it forged, it, or it kind of gives hope to the, you know, going forward that maybe um, he will be present. Uh, if not to the family, to, to his children, he will continue to be the father. Maybe he won't, maybe he will. It's a man. <laughs> our time is up um, Pile our time is up and thank you so much guys for joining us the book is available the book is available and Cynthia will be here for autographs if you already have one buy one for a family member let's support our authors they're doing a great job thank you wow